All right, this is a two for one today. We're talking about simple harmonic motion, AKA SHM. But there's two practicals. We have a pendulum, also known as a simple pendulum, and we have a mass spring system. Very similar equations for both. Time period of a pendulum is given by two pi times the length of the string divided by G. And for a mass spring system, two pi times M over K. M is the mass on the spring and K is the spring constant. So what we're gonna do with the pendulum is vary L, that's our independent, and we're gonna measure t, the time period T. That's our dependent. For the mass spring system, we're going to vary the mass. We could vary K as well, but it's much easier to vary M. And again, we're gonna measure T. So the setup for the pendulum is as follows. We want to have a clamp stand, a retort stand, holding our pendulum. And there's our string with our bob on the end. Now you have to be careful with the length of the string. The length of the string is from where it pivots to the center of the bob because we wanna go for the center of mass. So L is from pivot to center of bob. If you measure to the top or the bottom, then you're introducing a systematic error. And we wanna measure that with a ruler we want to be careful to avoid parallax error by having the ruler close to the piece of string. There's a few things we can do with this to reduce uncertainties. If we have a heavy bob, that means that effect of air resistance or drag is reduced. Because if we have a really light bob, that means that the damping force will decelerate it quite a bit. We want a light inextensible string if it's light, then that means that the center of mass is still gonna be at the bottom, as opposed to shift it up a little bit. And if it's inextensible, then that means that the length of the string will stay constant, even when there's tension on it as it goes through, especially at equilibrium. We want to displace less than 10 degrees from equilibrium. Now, what's the reason for that? Well, it's because this equation at the top here this assumes that the path is a straight line, whereas we know that it's actually a curve. And so this equation is accurate for small angles, but it gets less and less accurate as you get bigger angles because you end up getting further away from a straight line. So we arbitrarily say 10 degrees. And with our controls, we therefore have mass, angle, at amplitude, that is when we let it go. Same string as well, so we can be sure that the mass doesn't change as we go through the experiment. What about the mass spring system then? Well, here's our setup here. We have a clamp stand. We have a spring with some slotted masses on. So we're gonna pull it down or lift it up and then let it just oscillate and we're gonna measure the time period. A couple of things to make sure that we get an accurate reading. Well, first of all, we have our controls. We want the same spring, otherwise spring constant is gonna change. And so therefore we're going to displace initially lower than max displacement. In other words, we want the amplitude to be fairly small. We don't need the amplitude to be massive in order to get good results. So what's gonna be common for both of these? Well, we're going to displace to let go under SHM. In other words, we just wanna set them going. We want the pendulum to start swinging. We want the mass to start going up and down. We wanna use a fiducial marker. It could be a nail or something like that. So you can tell exactly where equilibrium is when the pendulum or the mass is moving. We wanna reduce parallax error by being at eye level with the marker. As per usual, when we're timing any periodic motion, we want to record time taken for 10 full oscillations. That's there to the other side and back again. And then we want to calculate the mean. Obviously this is more precise. So what can you then do with your results? Well, you can end up with a graph of, well, we can't have T against L because we can see that T is not proportional to L. If we have T squared against L, then we will end up with a nice straight line. Square in the whole equation, we can see that T squared is equal to four pi squared L over G. And so this is our gradient here. If we rearrange the equation to find T squared against L. So therefore we can verify G using, well, 
if this is our gradient, then we can say the gradient equals four pi squared over G. So G is equal to four pi squared over the gradient. Similarly, for the mass spring system, we want a graph of T squared against M. Nice straight line, the gradient is gonna be T squared over M. And so again, if we square the equation, then that's gonna give us four pi squared over K. We can verify K by carrying out Hooke's law investigation, and that is F equals KX. We can stretch the spring by adding on 100 grams and obviously finding our force and then finding out the gradient of that. And that's gonna be equal to our spring constant. We can compare the K from our SHM experiment to the K from our Hooke's law investigation for the same spring. Just stretch it and see how far it stretches. Source of error, well, you can do repeats of these if you want and you can get three times and then find a mean of them and you can plot those on the graphs. However, what you'll find is that they will be very, very similar to each other. So you'll find that the uncertainty due to that is gonna be fairly minimal. So this is one of those practicals that I would generally not do any analysis of uncertainties for. Just find your G, compare to 9.8, and maybe find the error, that is the percentage difference between 9.8 and your calculated value. Same thing for K for the mass spring system. And that's it, if you found this helpful, please leave a like. If you wanna see me doing this in real life, then follow the card and it'll take you to the video that I made for Marsbury Science. And I always appreciate you guys' suggestions and feedback, so if you have any, put it in a comment down below. And I'll see you guys next time.